Uh, so my name is Steve McManus. Um, I'm the chief executive of the Royal Berkshire Hospitals, and I'll give a little bit more background about that uh, in a bit. Um, chief executive, when I've said chief executive, some people have looked at me blankly. Uh, hospital director uh, may well be another way uh, of putting it. Um, fantastic to be a UK citizen here amongst European friends. Uh, so uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm even more delighted to see so many people in the room with the words hospital and management in the title, uh, which, is, which, is, uh, which is great. Um, uh, also, this talk for the next 20, 25 minutes will be the least scientific and the least pre-analytical uh, talk that you'll have. But what I'm absolutely passionate about is uh, leadership uh, and patient safety, and that's what I'll uh, certainly be focusing on. Um, so uh, the other thing is to say well done. Um, so uh, often networking plus alcohol uh, equals resuscitation uh, in the next, uh, the next morning. So firstly, well done uh, in terms of uh, being here uh, this morning for this uh, first session. Um, and uh, as I think um, there's the, some of our uh, Slovenian colleagues uh, here, yeah, excellent, uh, so uh, said to me last night, you may well be uh, the only speaker who has more people at the end of the session than at the start um, as people start to drift in. So, uh, so thank you for that kind of comment. Um, so what, what we're going to cover um, over the next 20 minutes or so, um, I want to focus on uh, the leadership contribution around patient safety and certainly how I as a hospital director or as a chief executive look at that leadership contribution. I'm going to give a little bit of background about the Royal Berkshire Hospitals um, because uh, it's important to locate my organisation in the context of all of you. Um, you all work in busy organisations across Europe and we're all the same. We're all doing the same thing uh, to the same end, which is trying to actually deliver outstanding clinical care uh, and the safest care that we can. So that context about my organisation and how we do that is also important. And also a little bit about patient safety as it's seen uh, in the NHS as well. Um, I'm going to touch uh, very briefly on values because something that runs right the way through uh, this talk, but certainly my leadership, is how the values that we hold um, and the behaviours that we exhibit uh, in the clinical practice that we undertake really helps to drive um, our focus on patient safety. And then I'm going to put forward three kind of interventions that I believe as a leader uh, are certainly the three things that I focus on um, around uh, developing a positive safety culture. So seeing safety as a strategic intent, something that we actively think about uh, every day in what we do within our organisations. Uh, really looking at learning, learning being at the heart uh, of uh, developing that safety culture. And the fact that you're all here at this conference uh, means that you are, you are leaders that are learning um, and, and looking to improve around patient safety. Uh, and creating the right conditions uh, for clinical teams to operate within. So that's what we're going to look to cover. But uh, there's a number of questions for you, I think, as, uh, as you've seen throughout the day yesterday. So my kind of first question, um, and this is... Um, clearly a bit risky for me in terms of, uh, uh, of the, the potential answers there. Um, so the, the question really is about hospital management and the role um, in patient safety. So either uh, no discernible role at all, uh, it's all down to clinical teams and people on the shop floor. It's a bit transactional. What we do, what I do is look after the money. Um, or do we have a more kind of active and positive role uh, in the way that we can support uh, patient safety? So let's, there's no right or wrong answers, so let's, uh, let's get a view. Okay, well, my job's done here. Thanks very much. It's been great to see everybody. Uh, well, that's, that's amazing, actually, if, uh, if the starting point uh, is that, um, that there's a view that we have a very active role, which uh, is absolutely kind of my contention. Um, so I want to say a little bit about uh, my organisation, just um, so as you've got that kind of framed, really. So the Royal Berkshire Hospital um, is um, something I'm really proud of uh, in terms of being the, the chief executive, the hospital director, to, to lead that organisation. Um, the building that you see uh, there is uh, the old front entrance, and it's still an active part uh, of our organisation. Uh, where we still have clinical services operating uh, from there. Uh, we opened our doors. In fact, we opened those doors uh, to our first patient on the 27th of May, 1837. And we've been providing continuous health care, uh, sorry, 1839, and we've been providing continuous health care 
ever since. So it's our 180th anniversary uh, this year. Uh, we uh, employ around 5,000, 5,500 staff, and we uh, work across uh, six uh, different hospitals, one in Reading and five other hospitals uh, across Berkshire, delivering a whole range uh, of healthcare services uh, to a population uh, of just under a, a million people. Um, we have staff from 39 different countries, uh, so uh, again, uh, contrary to popular belief, we're open for business in terms of recruitment from uh, UK, the U uh, European Union, uh, and uh, further beyond as well. Um, so where we are, um, sorry, uh, so uh, where we're located, uh, so we're in uh, the Royal County of, uh, of Berkshire, um, and uh, that uh, is um, located about uh, 30 to 40 miles to uh, the west of um, London. Uh, we're a very uh, rural county, um, uh, but also uh, with uh, an, uh, urban um, conurbations with kind of uh, populations in large centres like Reading, which is where the Royal Berkshire Hospital uh, is based. Um, we're entitled the Royal uh, County of Berkshire because we also are home to uh, one of the Queen's residents uh, at um, Windsor Castle. Um, a typical day uh, for us at the Royal Berkshire Hospital in terms of uh, what we do, we uh, are a busy district general hospital with a number of specialist services such as cancer services, renal services. Uh, we host uh, the regional heart attack centre, uh, the hyperacute stroke centre, uh, and we provide various specialist services like uh, bariatric services, as well as a range of general hospital services and pathology services uh, as well. Um, the reason, again, kind of uh, focusing on this is that uh, this is uh, our typical day where the touch points of patient safety. So we have over 1,500 outpatient uh, consults a day, three to 400 patients coming through our emergency services, over 1,000 imaging tests, over 1,000 lab uh, laboratory tests. And they are all touch points where patient safety uh, is at the heart of what we do um, and uh, is where we need to kind of focus on uh, improvement. Um, the other thing I'm uh, extremely proud of to be involved in is um, I chair um, a uh, patient safety collaborative which is a uh, regional um, collaborative of 15 patient safety uh, centres across the whole of the NHS. These are hosted within uh, the Academic Health Science Network, and there are 15 Academic Health Science Networks across the NHS. Each hosts a patient safety collaborative, um, and they generally serve a population of about uh, 3 million. And there are four major uh, national patient safety uh, areas of focus. Uh, so we're focusing on the deteriorating patient, uh, including our sepsis pathways. We focus on maternity and neonatal care, on uh, medications management and medication errors, and also the adoption and spread of best practice around uh, patient safety. So again, it's something I'm really proud of to be part of. Uh, it's a really important part of my role uh, as a hospital leader in terms of promoting patient safety. Uh, and it's something that we can actually bring uh, and spread into our organisation and beyond. So I said uh, I touched something on uh, our values. Um, so our values are really, really important uh, in terms of how we operate. So within uh, my organisation, we have uh, our four care values around being compassionate, aspirational, resourceful, uh, and looking for excellence. So those values actually determine the day-to-day behaviours uh, that the staff across my organisation uh, undertake. And I expect the 5,500 staff uh, to behave in a way that looks to deliver the best uh, patient safety uh, uh, and the best environment possible uh, to support that. One of the phrases that uh, we use within the organisation is, the standard you walk past is the standard you expect. So actually, the standards that come through our values and our behaviours uh, are absolutely essential to us. So, one of my kind of first uh, kind of areas, first of three in terms of the interventions that certainly I see as a uh, hospital uh, leader, as a chief executive, is around 
uh, safety as being a strategic priority. It's a strategic intent. Um, the role of a strategic leader is to set an ambition based on where you see the capabilities and the opportunities of your organisation. It needs to be a rallying cry. It needs to be a standard that you set uh, within, uh, within your organisation. Uh, and an example of where we've looked to do that at the Royal Berkshire Hospital, but in a wider context within the system that we operate in, is around uh, sepsis. So we've set an ambition that by 2025, our health system will be the top 20 in the world for how we manage patients with sepsis. Looking to save lives, looking to uh, improve lives. And that's uh, a really stretching ambition that we've set, but it's one that the organisation and the wider system has absolutely uh, got behind and bought into. And the reason that's important um, is because, uh, certainly when we've looked at sepsis in Berkshire West, uh, sepsis in the UK uh, has a really high mor uh, mortality. It's one of the major killers uh, of, uh, of our people, of our population, and it's fivefold higher in terms of mortality uh, than patients who are having uh, an MI uh, or a stroke. So time is critical within sepsis. Um, and when uh, our services are under pressure, also, uh, say, during winter periods, actually um, the, the time uh, criticality around our pathways in sepsis can lead to more patients being harmed if we don't get that right. So we've been focusing very much as a, an organisation and uh, as a local system on how we can actually make improvements in that pathway around sepsis as a strategic ambition around patient safety. The way we've been uh, looking at is around uh, safe sepsis six uh, at first contact. So this is a partnership that we've been undertaking between my organisation, working with our GPs locally, and also working with paramedics that work out of uh, the ambulance service to really extend the emergency department care around sepsis into uh, the community location. Um, we're starting to deliver, say, emergency department uh, interventions right at the point of first contact with our primary care and our paramedic uh, colleagues uh, in people's homes before they're transported to the emergency department, really looking at those red flags uh, that start to indicate uh, a patient with a likely uh, cause, underlying cause of sepsis. So some of the specific aims that we've been working together within that ambition has been the formal identification of the uh, amber and red flags of sepsis when we've been using our screening tools, uh, been looking at paramedics rather than GPs being first point of contact with patients who are uh, showing signs of those red flags uh, on initial assessment and looking at the immediate um, input that uh, we can provide, whereas before we were mainly uh, providing two of the six uh, sepsis first-line treatments and actually trying to provide all six of those in the shortest amount of time. So the existing care pathways that were uh, evident within uh, Berkshire West as a system uh, was that uh, there was a request for a home visit based on an indication around patient's condition. The GP may well have got to uh, the patient in the afternoon because of having a busy GP clinic in the morning. The red flag uh, around sepsis may well have been identified leading to an ambulance call, uh, paramedics arriving, uh, oxygen and IV fluids being two of the indications started, and then transportation to the emergency department, blood cultures, IV antibiotics, and the sepsis, sepsis 6 initial treatment then being completed, with a total time of around seven hours. And we know that the mortality issues around that were absolutely leading to harm uh, for our patients and certainly weren't in line with the ambitions that we had around being a world-leading uh, organisation uh, and system uh, in terms of how we uh, did that care. With the new pathway uh, that we've introduced, again, across the whole of the system, that total time has been reduced to an hour and 15 minutes. And so um, uh, early intervention by paramedics, early um, uh, input in terms of IV antibiotics and the other uh, aspects of the sepsis 6 uh, pathway uh, is really starting to change for us um, the whole of that pathway and that ambition that we have about uh, leading, uh, being a leading organisation and system in terms of safety for patients with sepsis. Um, and it is a team uh, approach. So uh, the picture here is of kind of our colleagues across um, our paramedics, GPs, 
uh, hospital kind of staff, admin staff, who are all involved um, in that piece of work. Uh, and again, leading uh, around that kind of ambition um, around uh, our sepsis pathway. So the second question I just wanted to, to pose is, uh, does your organisation have a world-leading aspiration for patient safety? Okay, so quite, so quite mixed. So really great that actually in the audience um, there, there are colleagues who, who absolutely have that. Um, equally, um, people have been saying that, uh, that, that there isn't, uh, or at least you're, you're going to think about that. And, and I would really encourage all of you, the very fact that you are here uh, as uh, uh, leaders at this event, to be able to go back to your organisations and kind of agitate for that ambition uh, because that ambition around uh, patient safety and having a focus around that uh, is a really important aspect of developing the right culture uh, within uh, your organisations. So the second area that I want to touch on, the second uh, intervention, is really around how learning is at the heart uh, of a safety culture. Um, learning is a safety intervention and creating a culture where learning is normal behaviour uh, is a, as a leadership requirement, and it's certainly something, as a hospital chief executive and as a hospital director, uh, very part of my uh, role is to help create that learning uh, organisation. And within our organisation, our mission is to be uh, an inquiring hospital, an inquiring organisation, where each day our people uh, are considering uh, this uh, question, how can we be better than yesterday? Um, and again, setting that kind of environment so we can question openly about improvement uh, as part of the, the learning environment. Improvement for patient safety is a really important condition um, around uh, setting that kind of culture. So uh, within my organisation, we have a whole uh, number of ways of creating that culture of learning. Um, we have uh, learning uh, continuously from uh, trying to understand the human factors where things don't go right. So, human factors, looking at simulation, retrying, working with teams about where pathways haven't worked and being constructive about that learning is a part of uh, what we do within our organisation. Also, creating the opportunity uh, to speak up nationally within the NHS. There is um, the Freedom to Speak Up uh, programme, our Freedom to Speak Up Guardians, where people, if they don't feel immediately within the context of their teams, they can raise concerns there are other avenues to do that because being able to speak up within your organisation about things that aren't going right uh, is really important and a culture where people can be open and honest um, about issues that they're facing uh, is again a really important part of that safety culture. But also uh, investing in leadership development. So we partner with uh, the Henley Business School which is a, a well-known uh, business school around leadership development. So many uh, of our clinical and non-clinical staff are going through that leadership development where patient safety is actually part of uh, the curriculum. And also working with industry partners, so our colleagues with uh, organisations like BD, with Cerner, uh, with our academic partners in terms of the University of Oxford, University of Reading, is again a really important part of creating that environment for learning uh, that uh, focuses and supports patient safety. So I just wanted to touch on two particular uh, examples that uh, certainly within my organisation uh, we have uh, looked to develop around this area. So um, we've been uh, focusing uh, also on how we can look at um, our Above and Beyond programme, which is a programme of systematically learning from positive incidents. So just like we have incident reporting uh, around some of the things that don't always uh, go uh, well, uh, we've now introduced uh, learning from excellence and positive incident reporting. So we can actually look at the learning from those individual incidents, but also uh, looking at the themes uh, that uh, emerge from those uh, incidents as well. This has been something that our clinical teams have actually developed themselves and have spread across the organisation. And it's now part of our whole hospital reporting on patient safety. It's also something that goes into mortality and morbidity reviews within our clinical teams uh, around where there's been positive incidents that they can actually learn from. And there's a, a lot of evidence around how high-performing teams um, 
uh, are uh, able to um, look at positive uh, feedback uh, and learn from that. And that, too, that learning um, is a really important part uh, of what they do. Uh, and low-performing teams are twice as much, uh, share twice as much negative feedback than, than average teams. So we know high-performing teams actually share the positive incidences, and we've looked to do that more systematically across our organisation as part of our learning environment. The other area uh, of learning I kind of talked on is about partnerships, um, uh, partnerships with our uh, local academic partners and, and with our industry partners, um, and we've really benefited from those formal partnerships. Um, this is a good example of that where one of our interventional uh, radiologists, Dr. Mark uh, Little, um, has been working on a particular program called Genesis, uh, which is a new intervention uh, around um, the care of patients with osteoarthritis. Um, and this is a uh, first um, technique uh, in uh, Europe. And again, it's about our being uh, open and able to look at, with partners, develop new techniques and bring those kind of into the organisation uh, and learn from those. So um, third question um, is, within your organisation, um, is there a systematic way... Uh, of learning through positive reporting, through excellence uh, reporting, um, and is that kind of part of your, your culture? Okay, again, so um, uh, a, a kind of mixed, kind of bad there. So it's again great to see that in uh, some uh, organizations, some colleagues in, in this room, that. Uh, there, there already is that systematic kind of approach uh, to learning, but again, uh, you know, hopefully in terms of the, uh, the, the discussion here, uh, may well spark some kind of thinking about what you can take back into your own teams uh, around learning from positive incidents. But again, challenging your hospital management, your hospital leadership about how positive incident reporting uh, should be or could be part of the culture within your organisation uh, in terms of learning as well. So um, the, the final kind of intervention, the final area, uh, is really around how hospital leadership uh, needs to create the right conditions uh, for clinical uh, colleagues, clinical teams, uh, to operate in terms of being as effective as possible. And for me, this is in kind of three areas around maximising clinical performance and clinical efficiency, really allowing clinical teams to work to the top of their licence. Enhancing diagnostic capability where there are opportunities to do that and optimising and standardising the ways that work, um, workflows actually uh, take place. And again, have uh, two examples just to, to run through uh, on that. So the first example certainly from my organisation is um, around our uh, laboratory testing um, and how we've introduced uh, point of care testing uh, through our emergency department around the management of, of flu, certainly uh, at certain points uh, within the year. We moved to a centralised pathology service in partnership with three other hospitals uh, two years ago, and that's had many positive benefits in terms of some of the pre-analytical issues uh, that we faced previously, some of the efficiency issues, and being able to actually work uh, at scale. But we also found some of the challenges around turnaround time uh, particularly for our flu testing pathway, were causing real delays and real challenges um, within our decision-making for our clinicians, uh, within our emergency department, our acute medical units uh, and beyond. So our ability to use effectively our isolation facilities, our side rooms, our ability to really channel the patients into the right locations around critical care or high dependency rather than standard ward care uh, was uh, being inhibited to an extent in terms of the turnaround time and the way that we were looking at our, some of our pathology pathways. So again, through um, working in partnership with our pathology services, working uh, with our clinical teams, um, introduced uh, local uh, flu point of care testing into the emergency department and uh, the ability to really use that information, that diagnostic test as part of the pathway to triage the best location at an early stage for patients uh, to be channeled into our hospital capacity. And we found certainly over uh, the last winter period, our use of isolation facilities, having the right patients within our critical care locations, being able to manage kind of patients 
as effectively as possible with the right resources has really been enhanced through um, this uh, initiative and this introduction at a local level in partnership with our pathology services as well. Second area, just an example to focus on, is uh, around uh, decision support uh, and creating and supporting clinicians with the right conditions around that. We have a, a five-year programme at the Royal Berkshire Hospitals to become a fully digital hospital. Um, it's not an IT programme. It's a major clinical and operational change programme in the way that we work clinically uh, and the way that we optimise our pathways across the whole of the organisation. And this has really allowed us um, within clinical teams, within pathways of care, to look at how we can embed within our uh, electronic patient record, our digital hospital systems, um, the opportunity for decision support. And three particular areas um, that we've embedded electronically into uh, that digital record is around our sepsis pathway, again to focus uh, and support clinical decision making around right sepsis care, uh, it's also been around our medication prescribing, so our electronic prescribing has uh, supported and assisted um, decision support in the areas of antibiotic management uh, and the use of antibiotics. Uh, and finally, within our pathology services, so our decision support in terms of blood sampling and the right tests to take, uh, again, built up by clinical input into that digital record, uh, has been a really important uh, set of conditions that we've been able to create to help workflow and again to really support our clinical teams to work at the top of their license with the right information uh, available to them. So um, my contention and, and hopefully it uh, fits with that first question that you very kindly answered was that uh, the role of hospital leadership, uh, chief executive uh, role, the hospital director and certainly how I see my role is to create the conditions uh, for outstanding patient care uh, that really values safety uh, at the heart of what we do and really values uh, creating a learning culture as part of uh, developing uh, patient safety uh, within an organisation. And that is very much the leadership role that, that I see day to day. So um, my final question, um, and uh, it may um, be, um, be again a bit risky, going back to that first question, uh, is just maybe ask that again um, in terms of hospital management and role in patient safety. I'm hoping that um, I've uh, certainly not lost anyone in terms of uh, that question and people think, thinking that it's got a significant role. But maybe if we just ask that question again. Oh, I think that might have even gone up one or two percent. So, uh, so thank you uh, for that. Um, so uh, finally, great thanks for, for, for having me here. Um, say it's uh, the, the least scientific uh, and uh, the least pre-analytical talk but um, I think uh, patient safety the reason why you're here at uh, this conference uh, and your leadership role uh, as well is absolutely vital in terms of creating that kind of positive env environment uh, around patient safety and certainly it's something that I'm extremely passionate about and see that all hospital directors all chief executives should have at the heart of their job uh, really focusing on that culture for patient safety. Uh, so thank you, um, and uh, over to you.